So today uh, is the 4th August 2020 in Australia and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Kelly Robello. Uh, she's a veterinarian and neuro or immunoscientist working on nervous system regeneration. Uh, her studies focus on stem cells, uh, differentiated stem cells, uh, using the EV instead of chemicals, um, biomaterials and immune cells to improve peripheral nerve regeneration after injury and or transplant and to reduce valerian degeneration. She's also interested on gene addition applied in mitochondrial diseases and developmental biology, nervous and immune system. So today uh, she's going to talk and share with us her work on neurons derived extracellular vesicles promote neural differentiation of ADSCs as a model to prevent peripheral nerve degeneration. Right. Okay, <laughs> uh, so today you talk it about neurons derived uh, extracellular vesicles and how they can induce some differentiation of the stem cells, on this case ADSCs, and how we use those cells to prevent um, kind of a slow down the Wallerian degeneration. I start with a background and then I walk it through some experiments that we did in our future directions. Uh, talking about peripheral nerve, just to um, let you know a little bit about that. Peripheral nerves is what you connect your brain to your organs. It's what you help you to do whatever you are doing right now, listen to me or talking or texting, uh, making you alive. It's what is helping your body be uh, in the full function. And basically it's a electrical cable that li links your brain to your organs. To understand a little bit about peripheral nerve injury, it's important to understand the peripheral nerve anatomy. And here, what we have is a sciatic, human sciatic nerve. And as you can see, it's a very complex structure. There is a lot of branches. It's quite big, as you can see here, it's more than 30 centimeters. And it's uh, really connects, um, looks like a tree connecting one um, big part of your organ to small uh, parts, for example, small, or, uh, small muscles, uh, making, for example, refined movements, things like that. Taking a close up, we have uh, in a nerve, the axon and the myelin, it's the function, uh, functional structure of your nerve. And the conjunct of axon myelin can be like 100 to 100, um, axons and myelin, they can be surrounded by an endoneurum and then the conjunct of axons, myelin and endoneurum. Also, it's kind of rapid for other structure that we call perineurum. And then this conjunct now of all these axons, myelin, endoneurum and perineurum, we can call fascicles and the conjunct of fascicles you'll be also surrounded by a third structure called epineurum. And out of this structure, you receive a blood supply, which you keep alive. As you can see, it's kind of a complex structure, but it really reminds us an electrical cable. Peripheral nerve injuries can affect anyone at any time. For example, you can be cooking and unfortunately cut your finger. You could be cutting your nerve and then you can lose the function of your nerve. Uh, you can just go outside and play some um, sports, tennis, whatever you like to do, soccer, and have some injury and then also can affect your nerve. Unfortunately, car accidents. It's quite common. Uh, this type of injury is really common on soldiers when they are on the battlefield. It's really common because uh, unfortunately they have a lot of injuries on the limbs and those injuries can involve it, the nerves. And happen at any age. Uh, there is no, um, they, of course, when you are more active, you can have more injuries. That's why you have more injuries when you are between 13 to 35. But then later on, you still can have some type of injury on your nerve, mainly on spinal cord or sciatic nerve when you are older. But anyway, it can happen on any uh, age. In all types of nerves, for example, um, in the 
the brachial complex, the nerves that are close to your neck, you can have injuries on kids because um, some pull, it's quite common the parents pull the kid, you know, and because of the traction uh, force, you can have a, a rupture of your nerve and uh, on the, the nerve of the kid. On adults, it's common on sciatic nerve. I almost sure then <laughs> a lot of people already felt just some um, sciatic pain. And sometimes over time, this pain can really get inflammation and turn it in a um, injury, in a chronic injury. And can be in all levels. For example, when you just have the action injury, uh, that's quite common uh, when you crush your elbow and you feel kind of a weird feeling on your arm, you know, kind of electric feeling. Uh, that is, uh, we call crushing the level one of injury because after one or two weeks, you not, you not feel anything anymore. Your nerve just, you recover and you not feel that weird sensation. But then more structures than are affected by the injury, more um, complex you'll be your injury, more hard you'll be to recover mainly also because you have some type of degeneration that happen on the nerve, we call Wallerian degeneration. Today, we are talking more about um, when you have a full cut on the nerve and what are the potential therapies and what we could do when we have this full cut, what happened. So when you have a full cut, what you, were, you have available right now to solve it uh, if you have this type of injury, if the gap of the injury is very small, probably your doctor, you try to just suture back, uh, connecting both uh, sides, and then you have a recovery of a function, but you'll not be 100%, but you'll be okay. But now when you have a big um, gap, a big injury, and here we are talking about three to five centimeters. Um, you have to try to find other solution because you cannot push both sides of the nerve to reconnect it. Then you can try, um, the doctor probably will try first some conduit is basically a tube, then you uh, connect both sides. The recover here we are talking about like a 20 percent, it's very low or the doctor can uh, suggest some um, transplant of nerve and then you receive a nerve from someone else. And unfortunately you have to go under systemic suppression therapy to avoid uh, any type of inflammation, any type of um, big immune response. And the last option is autograph is when you receive a piece of nerve from yourself and the select nerve then nowadays um, the doctors have been using is the sural nerve. It's a nerve that you have it on your leg and responsible for all the sensorial function of your foot on this side. Then basically if you use this nerve on yourself on other injury, on other nerve injury, for example, on the sciatic, you lose the function, the sensibility of uh, this part of your foot but may you have about two or three, sometimes 10 percent of a functional recover on, of your motor nerve. In this case, for example, the sciatic. Let's think about nerve injury as when your cell phone cable breaks. That's very upset. Of course, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? I can't not charge my cell phone anymore. What do you do? May a lot of structures were affected. What are my options? Basically the option then you have it, it's try to reconnect to the dot. For the cell phone cable, it's very easy to do that because uh, it's a very rigid structure, doesn't have vas uh, blood vessels, doesn't have epineurone, doesn't have other tissues, then really could, um, then need to be reconnected. Then this is a good strategy, but for the nerve doesn't work it well because you cannot reconnect to the dots mainly because of Wallerian degeneration. And what's interesting is humans have a very low Wallerian uh, functional recover uh, when they have a peripheral nerve injury. What doesn't happen, for example, on a zebra fish. But why we have a, such a low recover? 
as I mentioned before, because of Wallerian degeneration. Let's say you got an injury right here. Everything below the injury, you start to degenerate. You lose all the structures that were here. You lose axons, you lose um, all the endoneurium, you lose everything that could potentially be reconnected. But then, if you could slow down that, if you could gain time on the degeneration process, so we could basically reconnect the dots, reconnect the two cables as a cell phone. Let's say, just with more details, here's the sciatic nerve from human, and you got an injury right here on this black box. Everything below the nerve, below the box, I'm sorry, you're just going to start to degenerate and you lost the function. But then if we could basically just keep the structure how it is, that could be as our cell phone. But how we can reduce Wallerian degeneration? On this study, we try to use a stem cell. What are stem cells? Stem cells are, we have a, this type of cells on our body. We have in the fat tissue, adipose tissue, we have on the bone marrow, we have it uh, in small quantities on our skin, we do have on central um, nervous system, we do have it, this type of cell everywhere, a little bit, but we have it. And the cells are very interesting because they can proliferate and generate other cells, so they can help it on, in terms of its structure and the recover, for example. They also can differentiate it in many other cell types. They can differentiate it in neurons, they can differentiate it in bone, they can differentiate it in skin, and they can also immunomodulate. Today, we focus on the differentiation uh, capacity of those cells. And we will talk about mesenchymal stem cell. Mesenchymal stem cell is the type of cell that we have it, for example, on your adipose tissue. It's quite easy to isolate. So we could, we are talking here maybe in some autologous transplant. And when you isolate, you can maybe differentiate it before use it or when you have some type of injury, or you can also use a replacement or cell uh, there is a lot of it therapies, a lot of clinical trials already using that, and it and really looks promising. And a lot of it, studies have been really using and studying, seeing what the cells can differentiate it, because they are easy to isolate and easy to use it. Then why not? In terms of stem cell differentiation, we know that we have it many types of um, inductors. For example, in the inflammation, when you have inflammation, you got an injury and start out the inflammation process. The inflammation by itself can start to induce stem cell differentiation or at least you call those stem cells for immunomodulation. You also, for example, when you have hypoxia or some metabolism change, you have high or low glucose, high or low O2, also that can induce the stem cell differentiation. Other cells uh, also can induce the stem cell. The stem cell with stem cell can induce the differentiation process, but also neurons uh, can induce the stem cell to a differentiation pathway. And secretive factors, for example, chemosinase, uh, growth factors, hormones, and Today, we are talking about extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles are vesicles that most of the cells can release. We have uh, three types, apoptotic body, exosomes, and microvesicles. Today, uh, you talk a little bit more about, uh, in our study, we use a little bit more exosomes than microvesicles, but we did try to, uh, we did look both. The main difference between microvesicles and exosomes are what they can care, uh, the quantity and the size. For example, microvesicles, the range of size is between 50 to 1,000. They're kind of big. 
while exosomes are 40 to 120 nanometers, but both can modulate rec uh, the recipient cell, the cell that, the cell that you receive these EVs. In the central nervous system, there are some studies showing that astrocytes, microglia, as well pericytes and other endothelial cells can release EVs, and those EVs can start and help in the differentiation of stem cells than you have, for example, on your brain. We do have stem cells in the brain, and then, for example, when you have some trauma, some injury, all the other support cells can release EVs and help in the differentiation pathway, helping the stem cell that are on your brain differentiated in a mature neuron. Okay, we know that EVs can modulate adult neurogenesis. But then our question here is, could these EVs also induce a similar pathway, but now using other type of stem cell? Not a neuron stem cell, but adipocyte derivative stem cell. And could this induction result in, in a neuron-like cell? Some studies have been showing that other, uh, even stem cells can induce um, stem cell differentiation to neuron-like cells, as you can see here. But then on our study, we decided to use uh, EVs from neurons to induce cell differentiation of the stem cell from adipose tissue, the stem cell that everyone has a little bit, even though on your fat tissue. And we try it later to use the cells uh, as a way to reduce the Wallerian degeneration. Talking about our experiments, we first had to test it if our cells could really, um, if our stem cell could really start some differentiation uh, that was induced by neurons. We, our model was a mouse. Then we isolate stem cell, uh, derivative, adipocyte derivative stem cells from the mouse and neurons from the hippocampus. And we use a, a co-culture system where the cells, you not have a directly contact because there is just trans well here, this little insert. But there is a membrane that let pass couple um, let pass proteins, let pass um, EVs, and the size of it, the membrane, the microporos, are really uh, just you alloy passing these types of compounds. For example, the neuron you not be able to really cross and cross talking directly with the adipocyte derivative stem cell. So we culture the neurons in the top on that insert in that trans well. And in the bottom, we add stem cells, adipocyte derivative stem cells, and we call the system co-culture. So they, the cells were being cultured together, but we felt directly contact. And we rated, we analyzed the cell differentiation over time during three, seven, and 14 days. Because we know that, uh, for example, when you have a chemical uh, induction of a stem cell to start some neuron di differentiation, you take at least two weeks. Then that's why we look at for this time frame. And to prove it, if it, the stem cells were differentiating, we did uh, immunostochemistry, flow cytometry for beta-3 tubulin, that's a protein that we have in neurons, and SNAP25, that's a presynaptic protein. It's a protein that help it on the release of the synaptic vesicle. Uh, the synaptic, synaptic, synaptic vesicle is the vesicle that uh, is released by neurons and that's kind of proving that they are functional, they are mature, and they are performing synapses. And we also look at a lot of genes related to the neurogenesis. On the co-culture for beta-3 tubulin here in green, we were able to see that the stem cell starts some differentiation and even some change on morphology. For example, you can see really here on this cell, the cell really looks like a neuron, what 
it wasn't a morphology than we were seeing before. It's a morphology and the protein, the beta three tubulin started to um, express during the, the co-culture. And also SNAP25. We did see a lot of SNAP25 on our cells, on the stem cell in different levels, but also telling that maybe those stem cells were starting some uh, neuron function. When we quantify through flow cytometry, we saw that beta-3 tubulin was expressed, but really in a low quantity of our cells, in about 5% on the beginning when we started the co-culture for three days, and then decrease uh, after seven and 14 days. And then when we quantify SNAP25, we saw a little bit different. We saw then in the beginning of the culture, we had a similar quantity as beta-3 tubulin. But then at seven days of it, this contact with the neurons, we saw almost 14% of our population expressing this protein. Then we look at all the differentiation genes that uh, are related to the neurogenesis, for example, numb, then is related to keep the, for example, keeping the stem cell, the neuron stem cell um, as it is without differentiation. We look at BDNF, we look at CREB, we look at all this pathway, including microRNAs and some transcript transcriptive factors to see if our stem cell in this co-culture system were really uh, differentiated in some neuron-like cells. When we look at the gene expression, this is a stem cell after seven days of co-culture, after seven days in contact with neurons. And that's the neurons. What we can see is that our population, especially in seven days, is kind of a transition population. We do have uh, some indication of maybe mature neurons, and we have some indication also that transition cells, the stem cells that are starting to be a neurons. And when we compare with mature neurons, you can see then that you express much more genes uh, than are related to this mature state and the function of the neurons. But it's quite similar, the gene expression, especially when you look at MIB and CREB. Okay, we found cells then on this co-culture system that we believe it then were only passing proteins and EVs. It start to differentiated in neurons. But then the question is, were the EVs really involved on this process or other thing was inducing this differentiation? To test this hypothesis, we first uh, isolate our neurons and we label um, the neurons on the membrane in a way that we could track the vesicles in our culture system and also track the vesicles later on in vivo. This is a system that Dr. Lay developed. Um, he was very kind to donate the plasmid for us, uh, what we use on this experiment, and was very uh, important for us to use uh, this plasmid so we really could track it, our vesicles, in a, in a nice way. And we also, uh, for tracking in vivo later on our stem cells, the ones that were differentiated. We um, make it ourselves through using lentivirus system to express GFP and luciferase, so we could track in, in the co-culture and also on, with the luciferase expression later on. And we co-culture those cells, keeping the same system neurons and stem cells in the bottle. And now we decided to isolate microvesicles from neurons and they were labeled in red using the system that I mentioned before. And we also isolated the exosomes and we culture the stem cell with only microvesicles or only exosomes. And we track now the differentiation rate during three and seven days. Why three and seven days? because when we were uh, studying the co-culture system, we noted that those were the days that we had high expression of um, 
neurogen neurogenesis genes and also uh, proteins related to neurons, beta-3 tubulin and SNAP25. And how we analyze it ourselves, the ones that receive EVs. We again look at all the neurogenesis related, uh, the normal genes related to the neurogenesis, uh, for we see if the cells could be induced in a immature state or a kind of a start to uh, some specification to be or not a neuron or a mature neuron with activity with uh, expression, for example, or showing synapses. Uh, and then we also look at all the micro RNAs that were involved on this neurogenesis. And we look at for the SNAP25. As I mentioned before, SNAP25 is a protein that is related to the synapses. It's a protein that really you help it to hold the synaptic vesicle. It's a protein that help it in the synaptic synaptic vesicle release and also in the receive of the message of this synaptic vesicle. We isolate our exosomes and microvesicles. Microvesicles through centrifugations and exosome. We use exoquick. We decided to use exoquick because it was a way to really think about on a clinical trial, right? Um, it's not everywhere then may you have it ultracentrifuge. And then we thought, okay, exoquick, it's a nice way. It's an easy way that can be done everywhere if that will be the case. And we measure the size of it, the vesicles using nanocyte and also the concentration of the vesicles from neurons, from stem cell, from the co-culture uh, using also the nanocyte. We did uh, some characterization of the shape of our EVs using transmitted microscope, as you can see here. They did uh, show that uh, cup shape that uh, a lot of people have been mentioned. In some numbers, when we look at the size, now here focus on exosome, the size was surprisingly bigger than what we thought. And in terms of concentration, when you have a single cell culture of neuron or of a stem cell, you have it much less uh, vesicles. You have it much less uh, vesicles being released. But then when you have, for example, the co-culture at three and at seven days, you have a much more vesicles being released. And surprisingly, in the terms of neurons, over time, they also increase in terms of the uh, release of vesicles. Uh, more time in culture, more vesicles are released by neurons. We did the characterization of some proteins present in the membrane. We look at for Alex, CG63, CG9, and also our negative control cytochrome. Uh, proving that we were uh, working with exosomes. And using that nice plasmid that Dr. Lay donated for us, uh, kindly donated for us, we were able, under the microscope, look at if the neurons, uh, the vesicles from neurons, could be uptake by stem cells. Here's in green is our stem cell, here and here. And a little bit yellow, you can see the vesicles that were received uh, from the neurons. The vesicles derived from neurons were uptaken by our stem cells here, as you can see. It's kind of this yellowish uh, color. And then when we take a close up, we can see a lot of the vesicles from neurons that were uptake by the stem cells. And what is interesting is that those vesicles were really in the, around the nuclei of our cells. And then we look at all the genes related to neurogenesis. 
adult neurogenesis, and the cells then receive it EVs. We look at for NAM, before BDNF, for CREB, uh, really trying to see what state state of our cells you'll be after receiving this induction by uh, the, the neuron derived EVs. And what we found was that only two genes actually were high expressed, BDNF and TL, uh, TLX. BDNF is more related to a transition state, almost a mature state of a neuron, while TLX is more a transcriptive factor that regulates a little bit before the neurogenesis and was surprisingly the same activation pathway from the cells that receive it microvesicles and the cells that receive it exosomes. And when we compare with a cell that my stem cell then didn't receive any type of induction. There is no the that there is no expression of those genes. So we can conclude that then looks like the EV from neurons can induce some neuron differentiation of the stem cell, but it's a little bit different pathway than when we have a co-culture. Here's the co-culture. Uh, after three and seven days, those are cells after three days in after seven days, I'm sorry, receiving exosomes and microvesicles. And you can see that actually the activation of the genes are totally different. While on three days you have it much more uh, cells than you'll be expressing genes more related to a transition uh, between a stem cell and a mature neuron. And then after seven days, you have it other type of population with much more expression of a gene is related to mature neurons and also young immature neurons. On the exosomes and microvesicles, we just see these two genes, BDNF and TLX. It's very interesting how EVs actually probably are activating those cells in a different pathway than if they were in co-culture receiving actually the message all the time and having the cross-talking between stem cell and neurons. When you don't have the cross-talking, you have a different activation. While you have, when you have a cross-talking, looks like then you have a cells much more similar to the specific cell, for example, stem cell being much similar to neurons. And then we look at for SNAP25. If you don't remember, SNAP25, SNAP it's a protein that helps on the synapses. We quantify cells then, uh, for SNAP25. Here is on day three. And the cells that receive it exosomes actually were expressing this is SNAP25. What's kind of interesting, because when we, we go back here and look at the gene expression, we are not we are not seeing actually a, a cell expressing CREB and then you say, okay, the cell is doing synapsis. We don't see that, but we do see the SNAP25. SNAP when we did some Western blot and look at the SNAP25 SNAP on the exosomes, there was exosome strong neurons, exosome strong stem cell in our culture system. We found that we had snapped, we had snapped 25, but here is a neuron and how we kind of expected to see the snapped 25. We expected to see the protein only on 25 kilodots. While when you look at in the vesicles from neurons and the vesicles in the co-culture, we do see a isoform of this protein and quite much more, um, let's say express uh, on 50 kilodots. That looks like that maybe this protein is being carried by other proteins, but it's quite interesting. And that maybe explain why we are seeing this SNAP25 on our uh, exosome, on, on our stem cell that receive it exosomes. When we look at the microRNAs, just to recap, microRNAs are small RNAs that can control genes. 
in a down-regulated way. What means is, for example, if you have the CRAB being high express, you can have a microRNA, then you slow down the gene. You down-regulate the gene. And then we decide to look, okay, let's look at the microRNAs that are related to neurogenesis and see how they are in the EVs and how they are also inside of the cells. Here is at day three, we analyze the microRNAs on the stem cell by itself, neurons, on the EVs, microvesicles, and exosomes, and also the cells that receive those vesicles. And what we found out was that microRNA 9 and microRNA 132 were high express on the cells that receive it or microvesicles or receive it microvesicles or exosomes from neurons. At day seven, we see again a similar uh, profile of the cells and microRNAs. Also, we see a lot of, uh, we see microRNA 9 on the cells that receive exosomes and microRNA 9 also on the cells that receive microvesicles. And we see uh, a high express also of the microRNA 132. Talking a little bit deeper about the microRNA 132, uh, we see that the micro, microRNA 132 is expressed in our cells and also in the vesicles from neurons, but it's not expressed in the vesicles from the stem cell at least we didn't find it. And what is interesting is that after seven days of culture, for example, the cells that receive it exosomes, where the cells then have high express expression of this microRNA. And this microRNA micro induces neural maturation. Then maybe it's one, of, one explanation that we have it for that different pathway of differentiation. Okay, we found an nice cell that looks like it then can be used uh, in vivo. But does the cell has a uh, function? Can maybe solve it our problem than the water and the generation? For that, we did a co-culture system and we performed surgery using again a mouse. We cut the sciatica nerve and what we expect was the Everything below the cut, you start the degeneration because there is no blood supply, there is nothing that connects the dots. So this part you start the degeneration. We have less axons, we have much less function. But then, if I add my co-culture cell, if I add the cell that have been induced naturally by neurons, by EVs. Um, in this degeneration, in, in this environment, could slow down the water in degeneration. That was what we wanted to see. For that, we, as I mentioned before, we used a uh, stem cell that had expression of GFP and luciferase. We did some sciatic functional uh, assay just to see how was the functional recover. We analyzed it also the nerve and the fascicles, the axon, the myelin of the nerve, the nerve uh, by itself to see if it was, uh, how was that after the injury and the treatment. When we track in vivo those cells, we, if you remember, we used a plasmid that had the tomato being expressed, so the cells was red. Um, and our expectation was that we could track in vivo those cells. As uh, we saw Dr. Lay doing, we were like, okay, we're gonna add our cells, the ones that were differentiated. Maybe we're gonna see some EVs from neurons. We're gonna see something. But then when we added the cells that were differentiated, that's these two lines here, we didn't see anything. The, the cells didn't stay in the injury side probably they migrate. Something happened to those cells. We even look at in the histology and they weren't here. While a normal stem cell, the one that didn't receive any type of induction, is stayed in the injury side, as you can see here, over time kind of reduced probably because of the modulation, the environment modulation. And 
here is just uh, our quantification of this, proving that we actually couldn't see too much of the differentiated stem cell. When we look at the function of the sciatica, you can see at day three on the black line, it's our control. And in dark gray, it's the stem cell. And in light gray, it's the cell that was differentiated. You can see that actually closer to zero, it's better. Lower to zero, like farther from zero, it's worse. Then you can see that actually the cells then were differentiated were really good in, in terms of time. The function wasn't that bad. And especially what surprised us was on day seven, looks like then those cells really hold the function of the sciatic. And then we are, okay, but can't the cells modulate the environment and maybe slow down the water in the generation? What we did was we quantified the axons. And if you remember before, the axons have around the, the axon, we have the myelin. That's what gives the axon function. It's what you help the electric signal pass through the cell. And less myelin, less axons, less function. Then we can see here on the injury, what means? Means that was the sciatic nerve then didn't receive any type of treatment. And the sciatic nerve then received stem cell. We have a much less functional, uh, much less axons with myelin. While in a health nerve, a nerve that never had any type of injury and the nerve that received the uh, differentiated stem cell, you had a similar quantity of axons. This graph tells us a lot, tells us that actually looks like it then our differentiated stem cell really helped uh, to hold the Wallerian degeneration. And look at, and this analysis that I'm showing right here is from day 14. What means 14 days after injury? That's a very interesting result. Maybe we can reconnect to the cables. So as a conclusion, we were able to, to prove that EVs from neurons uh, are involved in the cell differentiation of stem cell. And those stem cells can reduce Wallerian degeneration. So we can have our checking market right here. And as a take home message, the EVs, as I mentioned before, they change the target cells. For example, on this case, we saw a case of neuron dif neuronal differentiation. Uh, induced by EVs. Of course, those cells are not amateur neurons, but there is high indication that those cells are uh, starting to be some neuron-like cells. And also, neuron-derived EVs can be uptaken by adipocyte-derived stem cell. What's very interesting, right? Imagine in an injury, uh, maybe those EVs can be uh, the send some messages from neurons after uh, a spinal cord injury, after a peripheral nerve injury, we know that they can be uptaken and there is some message to be delivered. Then they receive it and change the cells. And also the stem cell uh, from neurons, uh, the differentiated stem cells that were like uh, differentiated by neurons, derived EVs, they were able to reduce the water and degeneration. As you, if you remember that graph showing the number of axons. And le uh, last, what we can see is then stem cells uh, looks like it then can be a very promising therapy for peripheral nerve injury. Our next uh, future directions are really understand better what's happening and how, how is the, what's the role of the EVs on the stem cell differentiation, but now focus on neural, neuronal stem cell differentiation. We want to understand deeper how the message is delivery and why there is this difference when you have a, a full contact and when you just should, um, drop the vesicles in the culture, why it's different the pathways. And also, of course, if EVs could modulate water and degeneration, so we don't need the cells, right? We could just use EVs. 
at this point, I would like to really thank you everyone for your attention and also thank you all uh, my advisor, Dr. Carlos Ambrosio, my co-advisor, Dr. Juliano da Silveira, all the other professors and lab members that helped me. Uh, of course, if you money, I cannot do everything. Then I would like to say thank you for CAPS and FAPESP and also for my training uh, at John Lutvo uh, lab where I learned a lot about EVs. And I will be happy to take any type of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. This was a wonderful presentation. Very, very interesting. And I have several questions myself. And okay. another question. So yeah, we can start with, with one of mine. Um, so um, so you, were, you were trying to tackle a very, very important clinical problem. And, and it's very, very, a very nice project. But then you use ExoQuick to isolate the vesicles. And, and I understand your rationale. Um, but so not only you might have to confirm some of your data with other methods, but also uh, you are, how, how are you separating large vesicles from exosomes? What we did, we did some centrifugations and we had like a micro vesicles, kind of large vesicles uh, separate on the centrifugations. And then we use like exoquick for the small vesicles. But I didn't show here, <laughs> but we try ultra centrifuge to guarantee that we were really working with what we wanted. Uh, and we have similar results. But I just showed the data with ExoQuick. And of course, uh, for example, ExoQuick didn't work well when we tried to do the transmitted microscope uh, reading. We had to go back and go for ultra centrifugation. And, but we are thinking like, okay, but we need to kind of think about clinical application, right? Um, that's why here I just showed the ExoQuick, but we did with ultra centrifuge as well and we had similar results. Yeah, but sorry, I, I'm not, I, 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 I'm, I'm a little confused. So my question is, um, when you use ExoQuick, you pull mm -hmm. down all the vesicles and everything else that you can possibly pull down, but mm -hmm. you're not separating large and small. How do you separate large and small? Yeah, I, I may can go back here. We did some other centrifugations before to isolate yeah, we did like a several centrifugation. We didn't use like a, we didn't took the media and use ExoQuick right away. We did all their centrifugations before to get away from cell debris, get away from maybe a apoptotic body, get away from live cells. We also did some, uh, fil we f filter our uh, media. So we also has this uh, selection by filtration in size, the size selection by filtration, and then we went for ExoQuick. Yeah, you haven't answered my question. We might have to discuss uh, these uh, offline because, uh -huh. uh, because I understand that you have cleaned from cells and cell debris, but then when you put in ExoQuick, you're not separating large EVs and small EVs. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, we, we, can, we can, let's not get Yeah, started. I can, because maybe I, I'm not understand well, but yeah. maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe Juliano can talk it. Juliano is my co-advisor and ah. he's, yeah. Uh, Juliano, are you there? Yes. Hi, okay. Kelly. Hey. Uh, he hello, Dolores. Thank you for the question. <laughs> so, yeah, indeed, uh, Dolores' question is a really nice question. So the ExoQuick, we are, we are pretty sure. Let me turn on my camera here. It's kind of odd to... <laughs> I was just uh, walking my dogs. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, so the probably we have uh, larger vesicles, you know, and um, when we work with them, we, we call those uh, smaller than 200 nanometers because we use a uh, 0.2 uh, nanometer, 0.200 nanom uh, 200 nanometers filter to filter the sample before mixing with ExoQuick. And uh, of, of course, we have uh, vesicles there that are smaller and a vesicles that might be a little bit bigger, uh, close to 200 nanometers. I don't remember in your work, did we have the NTA already, Kelly, or not? No, we didn't. We didn't, yeah, okay. Yeah, because we, later we acquired the NTA just to have a better track idea. 
But yeah, this was a tricky uh, experiment because of the cell culture media and the low amount of um, EVs. So we tried several methods and we end up uh, working with X so quick. That was the one that he put a, a, a bit more uh, EVs for our analysis. But yeah, uh, we probably have a EVs that are uh, smaller than 200 nanometers. Okay. Um, I had another question. Um, so, so you in the in the RNA seq data, you show that microvesicles induce a higher um, changes in microRNA expression than exo. So, my question is: Did you find something specific to the exosomes that was induced only by the exosomes, or the pathways were always the same? Uh, I didn't find it a very specific way. Looks like it, then um, it's kind of tricky. And I understand your question before also, because looks like the microvesicles and exosomes, large and small vesicles, um, they induce really similar. And we try, yeah, it, it's it's tricky. <laughs> we we got in the same like okay, they are very similar. Maybe they are the same, we, we don't know, right? Um, we try to isolate as much as we could, but we cannot guarantee them, for example, we had microvesicles or not on okay. our approach. Okay, I'll, I'll, let, let's, there is also a question from Kaliani. Uh, are you there? Yes. yes. Uh, thanks, Dolores, and uh, thank you, Kelly, for the talk. Um, in one of your experiments where uh, you were talking about the restoration of the cytic nerve uh, function. So I was wondering whether, how did you take care of the revascularization uh, or the intraneural angiogenesis? Or uh, I mean, uh, did you use any of the angiogenic factors or did you just look into the nerve regeneration or the synapses, uh, not looking into the angiogenesis, or are you planning to do it uh, 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 in your future? That's a great question. When we look at our data, we're like, okay, looks like then we have some modulation of the uh, nerve. They didn't went down to the degeneration. But then we, we know that just the environment by itself could help, right? We have it, all the blood uh, going to there, all the inflammation factors. And that was our next, next question. Was only the cells or something else? Maybe those cells started to activate some other pathway and help it to keep it, um, the nerve, the health of the nerve. But we are still looking. <laughs> we, we didn't went too far. <laughs> Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and uh, just another, th now this reminds me of the inflammation part. So, um, of course, when there's nerve injury, it would be accompanied by the inflammation. So, uh, how would you tackle inflammation again? What do you mean? How uh, do I, yeah. Yeah, how do you take care of the inflammation when there is nerve injury and when you're trying to restore the uh, cytic nerve function? And uh, you want to uh, you want to curb the inflammation, right? You want to tear, uh, pull it down. So how would you do that? Uh, I mean, did you take care of it using any of the anti-inflammatory or anything? Did you look into that angle? Yeah, we didn't use anything. Um, actually, it looks like it. Uh, my guess um, for this question, I, I didn't look deeper, but my guess is then probably the cells that we added. Uh, went for a different pathway than if I just had added a stem cell without any mm -hmm. type of differentiation. Looks like the stem cell, we really see much more inflammation uh, mm -hmm. in comparison to this kind of a neuron-like cell. And okay. my okay. guess is that, that the inflammation really didn't happen because, I, I don't know, looks like it really modulates better the environment. And mm -hmm, I, I really, mm -hmm. I, I have the same like, okay, <laughs> and the inflammation. <laughs> but uh, if you look at, I have a one uh, article later on, then I'm just looking inflammation of the immunomodulatory um, cells in nerve because that was my next question. I was like, what, what's happening? <laughs> uh, 
absolutely because in one of your slides you were talking about the macrophages so i was yeah. just trying to uh, reconnect the inflammation with the nerve injury yeah I, my guess is that maybe those cells are activating much more m2 than m1 that, that's okay. my guess but yeah but i'm not sure <laughs> okay no problem thank you so much thank you welcome Okay, um, well, uh, thank you so much, Kelly. I actually have a uh, questions following uh, Dolores questions, I guess. Um, so when you look into the call culture method, um, what, what you've got there is uh, soluble molecules, uh, plus vesicles or membrane bound. And um, I'm just wondering whether you compare um, like, uh, how, how big is the role of the vesicles in comparison with the whole co-culture? If you look into that. Yeah, I, I did. I also just should look at uh, a media without uh, vesicles to see also if the media could play a big uh, role on that. Looks like for me that the vesicles they can uh, induce, but it's not the same as co-culture. Looks like it much more did cross-talking between stem cell and neurons and now there's like a back and forward it's does much more of a bigger work than if you just throw evs um davis does play a, a role but doesn't for me doesn't look like it as big as the co-culture the cross talking is much more um efficient than only evs but if you think in that body uh you're supposed to have that cross talk right mm. then so um, maybe maybe it's a good idea to look into a condition medium where you already depleted the vesicles and see that just the soluble uh, molecules affect, just to make sure that there mm -hmm. is a, whether there's a, a need of really that co-culture or is it the molecules that is in medium uh -huh. versus the vesicles. Yeah, I had in one of my slides something like that, uh, mm -hmm. just, just media with all vesicles. Uh, there is some induction of a uh, SNAP25 uh, protein, mm -hmm. but it's not high as when you have a co-culture system or when you have the EVs. Mm -hmm. But also there is some, some um, how to say, some effect. Then for me, it's kind of a clear that everything together is kind of the best. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think I think I guess uh, in a way that we need to have a sort of a good uh, system to purify your vesicles. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, with that, if there is no more questions, uh, we'll just wrap it up. And uh, next week uh, we are, we have uh, Andy Hill. So he's very well known. He's the past president for ISAF. And um, until then, please take care and um, see you soon.